Well, I'm so glad that you guys came in today. I pray that the Lord's uh, encouraged your heart this morning by worship. It's good to see Rocco back in action. I can tell you, these guys work really, really hard on all this stuff. And I, I appreciate it when I can enter into worship. Uh, it's, it's difficult. Well, this morning we're going to jump back into the book of Genesis, looking at the life of Jacob. And, and Jacob is, is on the hunt for a wife. You're a lively bunch today. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning, the opportunity to come in your presence with your people in this place. Thank you, Lord, for the time of worship when we can remember that you are for us and not against us, that your blessings extend to all generations and your mercy. We thank you. Lord, I thank you that you've called us out of darkness into your marvelous light, that you've opened up our eyes to understand and to have our faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you for the salvation that you purchased for us and for the illumination that you continually give to us by your Holy Spirit. I pray that you help us as we read your word, that we might learn from it, that we might be a more acceptable sacrifice for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're, we're going to look at uh, some kissing here today. Is this a kissing book? Well, yes, it is. In some respects, it is a kissing book. So I just figured I'd let you know it's coming up, so I'll let you know when that section comes. I wanted to bring up a passage this morning for you. Uh, the Lord put on my heart this morning, and I don't know why. If you remember, Paul had a thorn in the flesh. He had something in his life that he just couldn't shake. And so what he did is he went and prayed to the Lord about it. And he says, I've had this thing, this messenger of Satan who was sent to buffet me, beat him up. And the Lord spoke this to me. He says, my grace is sufficient to you and my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Can I get an amen? amen. Paul realized that the Lord had certain limitations on his abilities so that he might take pleasure in distresses and persecutions and difficulties and hardships. And I don't know about you, you take pleasure in those things? I take pleasure in a cold drink on a hot day. I take pleasure in a hot shower first thing in the morning. I take pleasure in shoes that fit. I take pleasure in the smell of the grass when it grows. I take pleasure in so many things and I have so far to go to take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and in needs and in persecutions and distresses. Because when we're weak, he's strong. Our weakness allows for his strength to be seen through us. And we know that it's not of us, it's of him. I'm reminded of that this morning because as I'm going to share this next chapter with you, I don't see a bright light in it at all. <laughs> and I would love to bring the good news. And it's, it's hard to find here. So let's look at the passage and see if I can learn something. Recently in Genesis, we've been looking at the family of Abraham. Of course, this Isaac, his only begotten son, as God calls him, and Jacob and Esau, two very different men born of the same mom almost at the same time. And yet they're very, very different. Esau, a man of the field, a man of the flesh, a man who lives for his appetites. And Jacob, a mild man who lived in tents. That's the best thing the Bible could say about him. And we know that Jacob is a deceiver. His name means deceiver. He's a heel catcher. He's somebody that would trip you up. He's always looking to deceive. And we've seen he and his mom colluded 
to steal a blessing from his father. We saw Isaac planting in various places and digging wells and God didn't give him rest until he actually met with the Lord. And that's where the Lord called him to stay and it was in Beersheba. And so we saw that God can bless you and you can find water virtually anywhere if God's with you. But it's different when you find him. It's different. You know, you can work virtually any state in, in the United States. I don't know why you would be here in New Jersey other than God called you here and hopefully you find him here. And we looked at Jacob trying to steal God's favor, which is a rather interesting concept, how he tried to take this firstborn right and how he gets, actually deludes his father and his father asks him five separate times, are you sure you're my son? You don't sound like my son. Come closer, let me smell you. Wait, let me touch you. He's trying to use all of the senses because his eyesight's gone. And he eventually gets to the point where he deceives his father and he goes out, Esau comes back and the whole thing is then known. And he begins to violently shake because he realizes God had his way because Jacob was the one who was to be the elder and because the elder will serve the younger, Esau will serve Jacob. And we get to see God's sovereignty in all things. Even through our chicanery and weirdness, God still works. And then we looked last week at Jacob who had to run and his mother sent him away and said, listen, your brother's pretty upset. He's boasting that he's going to be comforting himself by your death as soon as dad's gone. And it looked like he was close, but he's got another 20 years. Uh, Cause he says, you know, get me something to eat. So before I die, he said that for 20 years. <laughs> and Jacob running away, he's on his way back to his mom's home country in Haran and on the way, he stops in a place and the Lord gives him a dream and he sees this staircase going up into heaven and he sees the stairway to heaven, yes. And he sees angels ascending and descending on it and he says, God is in this place and I did not know it. And he called it Bethel or the house of God. He sets up this stone and he pours oil on it and he worships and he meets with God. This was Jacob's getting saved. This is Jacob having an encounter with God and God comes and reiterates all the promises that he gave to Abraham and said, I will be with you. And he goes, well, listen, since you're gonna be with me and you're gonna provide me food and take care of me and you're gonna see me through all of this, I'm gonna serve you and I'm gonna give you a 10th of everything that I have, which is a pretty good commitment. He makes a vow before God and he commits himself, much like what we did in worship here today. We commit ourselves to him. And we tell him the, the, the desire of our heart and we pray that he helps us to fulfill that. And so we saw this trip. We last left Jacob leaving the area here and going all the way up 550 miles and he gets saved. But Jacob is still raw. Any of you who've had a, a conflict and run into the living God, you know it doesn't change everything. It changes your heart. It changes your mind and the spirit of God is with you. And yet... There've been a whole lot of years of some bad learning that have to be undone, amen? amen. At least with me, maybe not with you good people. <laughs> but Jacob is not all of that just yet. And so God has some work to do on him and we're gonna see that work coming up. But there is some interesting things that you can see. He worships God. That's one thing that changes. It's the first time we see Jacob having a conflict or, or a, a run in with God and he worships the living God. The next thing he does is he works. He says, I'm gonna give you a 10th of everything I get. And he dedicates that. These are some earmarks that you can tell of somebody who's had an encounter with the living God. And number three, he walks. And we're gonna see that in the first verse of the next chapter. He walks away, but he walks away different. And he changes his behavior and his lifestyle. So we looked at all of this. This is actually the mountain that he slept on. And uh, there were some other things that happened at Bethel. In fact, there was a, a place where the tabernacle was set up, a large flat area. And all of this is excavated. And you can see it if you go to the Holy Land over into Jerusalem. So this week, we're going to look at learning to value truth. You know, very often we, we think the truth is a really good idea when someone else is giving it to us. But sometimes we don't want to tell the truth, Right. Like, does, does this shirt make me look fat? 
No, don't tell me the truth. You know, there's sometimes when we don't want to know the truth. There's sometimes we try to avoid the truth. Although it's, we value it, I think, internally, and certainly we do when we receive it, but we don't necessarily want to give it out. Police officer pulls you over and he goes, you know why I pulled you over? And you go, I have no idea. Could it have been I was going 75 in a 65? We don't, you know, so the truth is a funny thing and people tend to relativistically put it out there. But Jacob, who has been a deceiver and who is on the run, is going to not be able to outrun God and God's going to try to teach him some things, just like he does us. So we'll have to see if you fall into the same category. But he's encouraged by his mom, make sure you go back and find some of my relatives and marry a good girl, a good girl. Don't stick around here, it's a bad neighborhood. And so they send him out. And so Jacob goes off. In verse one, so Jacob went on his journey. Actually, it's kind of a bad transliteration from the original. It says that he lifted up his feet, which is, you know when you have a spring in your step, when you're excited to go somewhere and you're going somewhere you want to go? That's actually what happened to him. He began to lift up his feet. It's this idiom, which means he hurried upon his way. He was encouraged. He had, he had encouragement. So We see that this encounter with God changed even the way he walks toward his destination. So Jacob went on his journey and he came to the land of the people of the east. And he looked and he saw a well in a field and behold, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it for out of that well, they watered the flocks. A large stone was on the well's mouth And now all the flocks would be gathered there and they would roll the stone from the well's mouth and the water, the sheep, and put the stone back in its place in the well's mouth. We're given a long explanation of this well because I don't know how many of you have a well or how many of you have sheep, but I'm grateful for it because I didn't understand you have to cover a well because things evaporate and things like to crawl in wells. Uh, People tend to, you know, dump things like our sewer system. So they cover it over. So he comes to a well and it's in the middle of a field. We're told where this thing is. And there are sheep that are all gathered around it because that's where they get water. But there's a large stone on top of the well and there are shepherds hanging out. This is like the original water cooler. (laughs) Nobody's really doing any work. They're just kind of hanging out. Verse four, and Jacob said to them, my brethren, where are you from? And they said, we're from Haran. And he must have been excited because that's where he was going. And then he said to them, do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, we know him. (laughs) So he said to them, is he well? And they said, he is well. (laughs) The funny thing is they're having a conversation by a, A well, how deep? And look, and look, his daughter Rachel is coming with the sheep. Wow, how wonderful. He's on his way somewhere and it turns out that he's where he's supposed to be. 550 miles later, all on his own through arid and dry and rocky places, he finally is at the place where he's trying. Now this is before GPS, before smartphones. How in the world do you do that? Can I get some directions? You know, that, that's that got to be tough, 550 miles. So we get the idea, he runs into these shepherds and he goes, okay, I'm here. That's great. You're from Haran. I'm so excited. Do you know Laban? And they say, yeah. Yeah, we know him. And it's interesting. You notice the little he is, is in parentheses. Is, is he well? Like, could you give me some more information about Laban? Is, is he well? Well, that's what they say. They don't say he is well. He is is put in, so it's readable. Well, apparently they know a little something about Laban that he doesn't know. But he's about to find out. There are these little clues as you walk through the scriptures. And so all of a sudden they goes, oh yeah, and by the way, here comes Rachel with his sheep. Interesting. When I read through this story, I instantly went back to, to uh, the story of Mowgli. 
and the little girl who went to get water and out, until she got a home of her own and she's singing this song and Mowgli looks over at her and he's like transfixed because he's never seen a girl before. You guys remember that in Jungle Book? I just thought it was one of the cutest things. And all of a sudden, something happens to his face. He, he starts to have a smile and he wonders, why in the world am I smiling? He's transfixed by this, by this young girl, right? So I just have Jungle Book in my mind. Forgive me. <coughs> and then he said, now he's speaking to these shepherds, right? And he said, look, it is still high day. It is not time for the cattle to be gathered together. What are the sheep and go and feed them? But they said, we cannot until the flocks are gathered together and they have rolled the stone from the well's mouth. Then we water the sheep. First of all, this guy shows up and starts bossing people around. What are you doing? It's the middle of the day. It's the hottest part of the day. Why are you hanging out with your sheep? What are your sheep and get about your business? Because there's this really good looking girl on her way here and I want to have a conversation with her and you're cramping my style. That's really what's going on. Those are the subtitles. But, but we can't. What do you mean you can't? Well, there's a stone on the well. It's, they have to move it. Who's they? What is there, a union? There's a stone movers union? So they're all hanging around, you know, we'll wait till we have a, another few hundred people here, then we'll open the well. And it wasn't even, they, were plan, they weren't even planning on opening the well. I think they were just trying to get away with, they're just being lazy. But he comes up and starts bossing them around. That, that doesn't win you friends. Now, while he was still speaking to them, Rachel came with her father's sheep and she was a shepherdess. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the, mouth, from the well's mouth. And he watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. He let her cut in line. He jumps into action. Now, you know, this guy looks more like Richard Simmons than a manly man, right? He's, he's a mild man who dwells in tents. That's, his, that's who he is. But he's moved to act because he sees this beautiful woman and he's like, get out of my way. And, and he moves the stone off the well because Rachel's there. And who gets first in line? Rachel does. Hi, how are you? Nice to see you. Is there, how you doing today? Everything Okay. That's just the way that I see it, okay? You get these, and you wonder if maybe these guys who are waiting by the well are waiting for Rachel. Because we understand she's a looker. And so he's a little, he's a little overwhelmed. And these guys are like, hey, you know what? You're really messing up the best part of our day here. So they're finally gonna move on. Now, then Jacob kissed Rachel. Oh boy. I know the girls are going, oh. The guys are like, oh man, what a bonehead move. You just don't, don't do that to someone you don't know. And you've never met before. You don't do that. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. Have you, girls, have you had a first date like this? <laughs> he kissed me and burst into tears and yelled. This is very uncomfortable. And Jacob told Rachel that he was his father's relative and he was Rebecca's son. And so she ran and told her father, ladies, if a guy you don't know comes up and kisses you and you don't know who he is, that's what you do. You run to your father, okay? <laughs> and then it came to pass, and Laban heard the report about Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and he embraced him and kissed him and brought him into his house. And he told Laban all these things. And Laban said to him, surely you are bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. 
and he stayed for a month. So he's instantly received at his relative's home. You got to wonder, why is Laban so enthusiastic about having him show up? Well, we saw Laban before in, in Rachel or in Rebecca earlier, because there was this unnamed servant who showed up and popped a bunch of gold on her wrist and in her ear and her nose. And suddenly she was all decked out in gold and that got Laban's attention. And now he finds out this young boy just came from that wealthy household. Oh, I got to meet him. Got to be nice to him. And so he goes out. I'm trying to tell you he's got other motives. And I'm not just imputing that on him. The rest of the story will reveal itself. So you don't think I'm being judgy. And so he sticks around for a month. What do you think Jacob is doing for a month? Well, what has he been doing at home? We know he's a mild man who dwells in tents. So he's probably got the remote found the most comfortable chair. He's hanging home. He's hanging in their house for a month. Don't know what you would do, but Laban's got a plan. Verse 15, then Laban said to Jacob, because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? He's probably not been doing anything for a month. And so Laban brings up this complex question. Hey, you've been here for a month, eating my food, sitting on my couch, watching my TV, riding my camels. You're my relative. Should you work for me for nothing? I can see Jacob go, what do you mean working? <laughs> working for you? Tell me, what should your wages be? Now, what do you think he's been doing for the last 30 days? He's been watching Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Hi. Oh, look, oh, she's going to get more food. Oh, that's nice. Rachel, could I get a glass of water? Thank you, appreciate that. He's been eyeing up his daughter for 30 days. Now, if he told Laban everything, he told him, hey, listen, I deceived my father into getting the blessing. I probably, he probably didn't bring that up or that it was through deception. He probably didn't bring that up. He probably didn't bring up the fact that he was sent there to get a wife or they would have negotiated immediately. So apparently he told him only the things he wanted to tell him because you see, Jacob is a deceiver and he lives off people having a certain impression that isn't necessarily accurate. So tell me, what should your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. Surprise. The name of the elder was Leah. And the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were delicate. That, that's a very nice way of saying she wasn't a looker. But Rachel was beautiful because it says, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. In the original, it means that she had the full package. Now, Jacob loved Rachel, probably loved at first sight at the well. I wouldn't necessarily call it well, maybe infatuation uh, at the well. And so he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, by the way, which is not unusual, your younger daughter. And Laban said, is it better that I give her to you than I should give to another man? I just see him saying that in a very Yiddish sort of way. <laughs> it is better that I give it to you than I should give to another man. Stay with me. I, I just feel like Mel Brooks should be in the, in the line of this. And so Jacob served seven years for Rachel and they seemed only a few days to him because of the love that he had for her. I thought for sure all the ladies would go, oh, there it is. I had to lead you in it, but okay. He worked seven years for Laban. Now this is a guy who doesn't work. He's a mild man who lives in tents, right? He's now being forced to work because Laban said, what? Should you work for me for nothing? Work? 
I, I thought I would just get married and, you know, inherit. <laughs> so he makes a deal. By the way, Leah's name means weary. Who would name their kid weary? <laughs> Sneezy, you know, like just... And Rachel's name means you or a, or a young lamb. And you know how cute a young lamb is. So she's got a cute name. Leah's got weary. Nice. And so I figure she looked something like this. Something about her eyes just didn't, her eyes didn't sparkle. You know, she just didn't have the, like the lights are on, nobody's home sort of. She probably was just a plain girl, didn't really do it for him. But that was Leah and, and Rachel, of course, you know, she was, you know, found in all the magazines and the guys all waited at the well for her to show up in the middle of the day. Man, it's really hot out here. I know, but Rachel's going to be coming soon. So that'll be exciting. So that's the scenario that I imagine in my sick, crazy mind. Now he goes for seven long years until he marries her. That's love, men. Love is willing to wait, by the way. Lust has to have it today. Love is I can wait. Lust is got to have it now. That's the difference. So anybody starts coming on to you, young ladies, and they got to have it today, tell them it'll take them seven years. <laughs> or bring them to me. I'll tell them it'll take seven years. It reminds me of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. And he loved Rachel and he is the one who said seven years. Now that is a high price to pay to marry somebody. I'm sure he could have found a better way to do this or a cheaper way to do this, but he didn't because he loved Rachel. And his evidence was seen in his willingness to wait. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife. For my days are fulfilled that I may go into her. I will not explain. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. Now it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, <coughs> And brought her to Jacob. And he went into her. And Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah as a maid. And so it came to pass in the morning. And behold, it was Leah. <laughs> and he said to Laban, what is this that you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why then have you deceived me? And Laban said, it must not be done so in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Oh boy. This is called retribution, boys and girls, because you remember how he got the blessing from his dad? He deceived his father to get the blessing of the firstborn. Now, this is something he doesn't respect, apparently, but he's going to learn a very heavy lesson right here, isn't he? This is God's retribution on his life. By deceit, he got the blessing, and now he's the one being deceived. Jacob, who's the deceiver, is now being schooled by an older deceiver by lying. And now the firstborn comes into play. Isn't it curious that he's being deceived in the same way that he used to deceive about the firstborn status? Isn't it amazing? So what goes around comes around or karma or whatever you want to call it. I call it God's retribution. And you'll see this as you go through the scriptures, which is a rather amazing thing. If you remember in Egypt at the time of Moses, Moses was called out, went to set the people free. If you remember the reason Moses got adopted into Pharaoh's household is because 
Pharaoh said, listen, I'm, I'm a little afraid of how many uh, Israelis there are, and uh, you got to eliminate them. So every male you must throw into the river. I want them all dead. In fact, he got the, the midwives to, to work that out with him, but they were unwilling to kill all the males and eventually wean off all of the children and so that he would have control of the population. And so he you would have to throw your child in the Nile and have them drown. Well, it's interesting. Moses' parents put, them, put him in the Nile, as they were told, but they didn't drown him. They put him in a basket that would float. So technically, they did put him in the Nile, but they didn't kill him, and praise God for that. It's interesting because after Moses goes away and comes back and he delivers the people and goes through the desert and they finally get up to the Red Sea and all the Egyptians are following. You know, the Lord parts the Red Sea and Charlton Heston, boom, 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 boom. And he goes through as on dry ground and he gets to the other side. And Pharaoh's men presume that, oh, it's going to stay open for us too. It's like a free toll. And they get in and then the waters close up on them. How did they die? By drowning. How did Pharaoh earlier try to kill all the children of Egypt? by drowning. All the men were the ones who pursued them in the chariots and on horses, and it was all the males who died. And as you go through the scripture, you see God weaves this retribution where it comes back. In Jacob's case, he's learning a very important lesson, and I think God is trying to burn off the impurity of deception out of his heart. And it's interesting because we know that Jacob takes on a new name, doesn't he, in a little bit? The name Israel which means governed by God. So no longer would he be called deceiver, but it's funny, it doesn't stick. Like Peter, you remember Peter? Je Jesus gave him a new name. There's a whole bunch of people who get new names, but it doesn't really stick to Jacob because Jacob carries with him this heart of deception, this heart of fear. And by the way, that's why people lie. It's because they're afraid to tell the truth. There's a deep insecurity about somebody knowing the real truth and oh my goodness, what would they think? It's a real people pleasing thing. Anyway, so he says, give me my wife. And of course she's veiled from head to toe. Now you don't know this. It wasn't like he was completely drunk out of his mind. Although if that's what Leah looked like. So I really couldn't find an uglier picture than that. Okay, I, I didn't want to offend anyone. So. He wakes up with the wrong woman. He just got a bad deal. Because who in the world is going to marry her? That's what Laban's thinking. And so he says, it's not our custom. Although, you know, within the last seven years, you could have said something. <laughs> the funny thing is, Laban knew about this. Leah certainly knew about this. But so did Rachel. Rachel. Rachel's at the wedding. You know, she's all bound up. And she's like, hey, she's wearing my, my clothes. Hey, she's getting married to the guy that I was engaged to for seven years. Why didn't she say something? There are no heroes in this story. That's why I have trouble telling it. So, Galatians 6, 7, and 8 says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. What the Scripture says is what goes around comes around. What you plant in the ground is what's going to come up. If you, if you put corn in the ground, you're going to get corn coming up, right? You, you can't expect to plant deception lying, unforgiveness. You can't think to plant those things in the ground and something good come up. It just won't. Because God is not mocked. He has set these laws in place. And what's coming back on Jacob is the thing that he practiced. And God is using it to get it out of his life. And I'm, I'm so grateful to God for that. Hebrews 12, 11 says, Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. You see, when you go through difficult trials in your life, hardship, 
wants, lackings. When you go through all of that, God is showing love toward you because he's trying to cook off something in you that doesn't belong there. And if you submit yourself to it, and if you do what James says and have joy in these trials, knowing that it develops perseverance, and you let perseverance have its perfect work, that you might be complete and entire, lacking in no good thing, when you do that and you submit yourself to the training of God, what you end up with is holiness. You become more like God. You become more totally given over to him and much less contaminated by the things that we carry around with us. I'm so glad we have a heavenly father that loves us enough to train us. We should be grateful enough to submit to it. And so what Laban says is, fulfill her week. Uh, by the way, that's seven years. It's a week of years. In, in, in the Jewish mind, week means seven days or seven months or seven years. So it can be, you can have a week of months. And actually they have a week of months and the seventh month is actually the first month of the new year. And if you have seven of those sevens, you have what's called the, the year of Jubilee. So you have a week, you have seven sevens or a week of sevens, then you have, anyway, never mind. Fulfill her week and we will give you this one also. I, I, he doesn't even call her by name, this one. It's such a commodity. Also for the service in which you will serve me still another seven years. You gave me seven years, you got Leah. And by the way, you don't get divorced in this culture. In fact, you can't even get divorced if you're engaged. There has to be a really good reason. There has to be physical immorality, uh, you know, sexual immorality, and there's a stoning afterwards. It's really difficult. And Jacob did so and fulfilled her week. So he worked another seven years for this guy. So he gave him his daughter, Rachel, as a wife also. And Laban gave his maid, Bilhah, to his daughter, Rachel, as a maid. And then Jacob also went into Rachel. And he also loved Rachel more than Leah. This is why polygamy isn't good. It's not good. I got two wives. I really love this one. This one kind of got scraped off on me. Like, you know, Laban just wanted to get rid of his older daughter and... I was a sucker. I didn't look under the veil until the morning and it was too late. Can you imagine how Leah feels? Unloved, disregarded, unappreciated. And I imagine she has been in her younger sister's shadow all her life. Oh, Rachel, all the guys are waiting at the well for Rachel and it's Rachel. You know, she's, you know that she's been in her shadow all of her life. And she's still in her shadow, even in a wedding. And now, who do you think he's spending the night with? The one he loves. But he has an obligation because the other one's his wife too. You know, men, they say it's a universal desire for men to have more than one woman. Until you read the Bible... No, no, one is more than enough. <laughs> Can I get an amen from the men? Amen. Okay, there we go, thank you. My wife's here, I'm being honest. One is enough, one is good. I can love one woman. And see, that's the problem. When married relationships get strained and suddenly there isn't this natural love like you typically have, it's usually because there's some distraction. There's another woman or another man, or it could be you're distracted by your kids and your kids are your whole world and you've completely forgotten you're married, or your job is your whole world and you've completely forgotten about your mate. Anyway, but I digress. He loved Rachel more than Leah and this creates a problem. And so can you imagine watching your sister, wife, Go into the tent for the night with your sister, with your husband. I can't imagine. Now, these are things that the Bible records, but it does not verify. It doesn't say, hey, this is the way you should live. 
Because we know that when God created Adam and Eve, he created one of each. We know that when the animals came, there was one of each. We know that the, the, in, the, in Noah's Ark, we know that there was one of each. You can go on and on and on. In fact, when you find a requirement for somebody who's going to be an elder, it says he must be the husband of one wife. He must be a one woman man. And so the scripture says it throughout. For a little while, I thought, and I always used to rib my wife and say, you know, the Bible's full of polygamy. So I guess I should be looking for somebody else. But she was pretty quick to straighten me out. <laughs> I have the scars. <laughs> Matthew 6, 25. Jesus says it very plainly. No one can serve two masters. Now, that's an overarching principle. Jesus is speaking about one thing. He's talking about devotion to God. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon or God and money. You can't say with your lips that you love God and he's the biggest thing in your life and money's the most important thing. You, you can't do that. Just like you can't have two wives. So he served Laban still another seven years and then the Lord saw that Leah was unloved. The Lord saw Leah. He opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben, because he was a tasty sandwich. <laughs> For she said, the Lord has surely looked on my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. Ladies. Do you think by any stretch of the imagination that if you bear a child for a man that he will love you? No. There's just no good news in this passage. <laughs> Thinking, I'm going, to I'm going to get this guy, I'm going to hook him in, and if I have a baby, oh, then he'll love me. Wow, how desperate is that? Do you hear the heart cry of this woman? She just wants to be loved, and she's not? That's why you have one. And love her well. Reuben, it's not a sandwich. It means behold a son. It's like, yo, look what I did for you. That's what it is. And she's saying, now, God will end my torture now, and he will love me. I'm going to be the favored wife from now on. I'm going to be the new Rachel. And he will, he will come to me every night, and he will forget about her. no. That's an illusion. Just because you've had a child doesn't mean it's going to happen. Behold a son. And I got news for you that didn't do it. Verse 33, and then she conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, he has therefore given me a son also. In other words, another one. And so she called his name Simeon. Simeon means God heard. The first one, ta-da, look what I did. Oh, he doesn't love me yet. Okay. Ta-da, I put out a second son. And by the way, sons were favored. They're the ones who inherit property. They're the ones that carry on the family name and all of that. And so it's remarkable that at, out of a 50-50 throw of the dice, she's cranked out two sons in a row. And he's named Herd because the Lord has heard and as far as she's concerned, this is my comfort for God, from God, because I am hated. I am hated by my husband. So I'm comforted by having a child. That's hardly a substitute. Right, right ladies? Right. A son is hardly a substitute for a husband. Trust me. Verse 34. She conceived again and bore a son and said, now this time my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore, his name was called Levi. Levi means joined. This is, this is the kid that's going to really make our marriage better. What? Having children doesn't make your marriage better. It's not going to join your husband to you. It's, it's a sad, sad thing. 
And she conceived again and bore a son and said, now I will praise the Lord. Ooh. Notice this son had nothing to do with her. Notice suddenly the Lord becomes the focus. It's not about being loved or being unloved or about being joined or being attached or being heard. I will now praise the Lord. You know, it's a long road before we're content to just praise God instead of trying to get things from other people. It's a long road to understand that we are loved by God and that he's enough and that if the whole world turns their back on you, it shouldn't crush you. And then you learn to do like Paul did, to rejoice in those shortcomings and those distresses and hardships and labors. And you just praise the Lord. I'm going to praise the Lord anyway. Hey, whatever it is that's in your life, this is ultimately where you need to get to, where you're going to praise the Lord and you're not looking for something that someone else is never going to provide for you. So Judah means praise, obviously. And it just means I will praise the Lord. She's, I had a fourth child and I lived. <laughs> praise the Lord. <laughs> now she's excited. She's excited about having it. She's having growth go on inside of her heart. Do you see that? Where it's no longer this kid's going to, you know, fill this void in me. No, I'm going to praise the Lord. It's like that with many of David's Psalms. He begins out all, you know, where are you, God? I cry all night, and my pillow's sopping wet. And, you know, where are you? You're like far from me, and I cry out day and night, and you're not there. And like he's complaining, and you're like, oh, Lord, you know, don't strike him down or anything. But then he begins to say, but you, oh, God, are enthroned in heaven. And, and then he starts to get all excited, and suddenly his problems don't mean anything because he's got his eyes on the Lord instead of his own problems. I see that that's where Leah finally got to, where I'm just going to praise the Lord. His name, is, his name is praise, Judah. And there's going to be a long history of interesting things that God's going to do with this entire tribe and this descendant, including bringing Jesus the Christ, the son of the living God. But that's not all the baby bearing and family dysfunction, but we'll have to pick that up next week. It's an interesting romance, isn't it? If you guys had a story to tell about how you met, I, I've, I've heard some of your stories. And some of you didn't like the person you ultimately married. It'd be interesting to hear those stories, but how God works all that together for good, I think is an absolute miracle.